In the first session, we looked at the structure categories of the Psalms. Uh, we looked at the lament of the individual, we looked at the category of descriptive praise and declarative praise. These were categories that were identified by Claus Vestermann, the pastor who was in prison during World War II and spent his years in prison studying the Psalms. And those are very helpful categories to consider as we're looking at the Psalms, but there's other categories as well, and these are categories that are based upon the topic rather than the structure. There are creation psalms, there are exodus psalms, there are Torah psalms, there are psalms that focus on penitence, there are psalms that teach us about the Messiah, there are psalms that focus on the wisdom of God, there are didactic or teaching psalms, psalms that speak about the enthronement of God, and psalms that actually pray for God's judgment on the enemies of the psalmist. And so these are based more on the topic rather than the structure. But we need to look at these as well. And so let's look at the first one of these psalms, which is an alphabetical psalm. And uh, the alphabetical psalms use the initial letters, um, of use the letters of the Hebrew alphabet as the initial letters of successive lines in the psalm. And it's a, it's a literary pattern in the psalm that helps the psalmist to remember uh, the psalm. And a good example of this, pro probably the best example, is Psalm 119. And if you turn to Psalm 119 in your Bibles, you'll see what I'm talking about with the alphabetical psalm. In Psalm 119, just before the first line, you see the word Aleph. And then it says, how blessed are those who uh, whose way is blameless. That word Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It corresponds to our A. And then down between verse 8 and verse 9, you'll see the word Bait. It's in the Hebrew text, and it's the letter that corresponds to B. All the lines of the Hebrew text from verse 1 to verse 8 begin with Aleph, A. And all the lines from verse 9 through verse 16 begin with the letter Bait, uh, uh, the B. And so you can see there's a, there's a pattern in these psalms that, that follows the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Here is Psalm 34, and you can see the letters, the sequence of letters from the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph is the, is the letter that begins the first line. And then Bet begins uh, actually verse 3. And then Gimel, uh, verse 4. Dalet, verse 5. He, Vav, um, uh, and then it continues on. And so this is a pattern that was designed to help the reader remember the psalm. It's the alphabetical psalm. And uh, there are uh, beautiful uh, words in this alphabetical psalm. This is Psalm 34. And let me just uh, highlight a few of the things in Psalm 34, <clears throat> which uh, follows this pattern using the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. <clears throat> And this, this psalm teaches that God is good to those who trust him. Boy, isn't that an encouraging thought? God is good. And uh, it emphasizes the, the blessedness of the one who takes refuge in the Lord. You know, Masada was a place for the Jews to find refuge uh, after the destruction of Jerusalem. And a group of Jews came to Masada. Um, but this was a, a fortress that was eventually captured by the Romans. And the Jews on this fortress of Masada took their own lives rather than becoming slaves to the Romans. It was a fortress, but it was a fortress that was defeated. Happy is the ones who are the woes who take refuge in the Lord. And so the psalmist begins in verse 34, or in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. I, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. He reports the deliverance in verse 4. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They, God's people, looked to him and were radiant. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man, the psalmist describes himself, cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out, out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them. It's a good thing to know that we have a God in whom we can trust. He is a refuge for his people. And uh, when you are afraid and uh, worried about the circumstances that you're facing, go to Psalm 34 
and uh, be reminded and comforted that uh, we have a God who is good and a God who we can place our trust and our confidence in. The, the uh, um, alphabetical psalms. And then we have the creation psalms. Uh, in the creation psalms, we see the creation of the physical universe is the central thrust of this particular psalm. And God's glory and his power are all demonstrated through his creation. I love the out of doors. I love the night sky. I love to go out and see what God has done in his creation. The waterfalls, the mountains, uh, the beauty of wildflowers in his creation. And I go out and I see God's handiwork and it reminds me of his person. I think of Psalm 19 verse 1. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament is declaring the work of his hands in Psalm 19 verse 1. And the psalmist goes on, day to day pours forth speech and night to night reveals knowledge. Well, then he adds, there is no speech, there are no words, the voice is not heard. So there's a silent message, a wordless message that is communicated through God's creation. And that is the message that there's a great creator, that God exists and he made all of what we see around us. The heavens do declare the glory of God amazingly. So the creation psalms emphasize what God has done. And I, I love to read the creation psalms, especially when I'm out camping or looking at the night sky or, or um, uh, spending some time in the out of doors. These creation psalms remind me that there is a great creator who created all these things. The Exodus psalms focus on the theme of God's deliverance from Egyptian bondage. And uh, the crossing of the Red Sea or the Reed Sea is a prominent feature of this particular kind of a psalm, the Exodus Psalms. And over and over again in Scripture, we find references to the Exodus, this great deliverance of God's people uh, from Egypt. And one of the Exodus Psalms is Psalm 114. Psalm 114. This is one of the psalms that is called the Hillel Psalms, and these were the psalms that were sung during the Passover. Psalm 113 through 118 were psalms that were sung during the Passover meal. And so we know that Jesus and his disciples sang this song uh, together in the upper room on the night uh, where Jesus broke the bread and uh, instituted the new covenant. Psalm 114, a psalm of God's mighty deeds, at the Exodus. When Israel went forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of a strange language. <laughs> Notice he's referring to Egyptian language in contrast to Hebrew, the people of a strange language. Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. Judah, the place where the temple was, was built, Israel his dominion. And then the effects of nature uh, when the Exodus took place. The sea looked and fled. The Jordan turned back. Remember when the Red Sea parted and the Jordan River stopped flowing? The mountains skipped like rams, the hill like, hills like lambs. Remember how the mountain quaked at Mount Sinai when God came down on the mountain? What ails you, O sea, that you flee, O Jordan, that you turn back? And, and the question is raised, what, what has caused all this, all this nature uh, to, to change and all these things to happen? And then the answer is given. Tremble, O earth, before the Lord, before the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool of water and flint into a fountain of water. And here we see the, the recollection of God's great a miracle of providing water from the rock for his people uh, there in the wilderness. The Psalms of, uh, of Exodus feature what God has done in uh, bringing his people out of Egypt. And these are, these are psalms that are, are particularly encouraging and, uh, and fun to read, psalms that are used at Passover. The next category that we consider are the imprecatory psalms. And these are a little bit strange for us because they call down a prayer, they call down for judgment on the psalmist's enemies. An imprecation is a prayer for judgment. And this is the leading feature of these psalms. These psalms have their theological basis in the Abrahamic covenant of Genesis 12, 
verses 1 through 3, where God promised to curse those who cursed Israel and to bless those who blessed Israel. You, know, you wonder, how can the psalmist call down God's judgment on his enemies? That just doesn't seem to be Christian. It doesn't seem to be right. But remember what God said to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. So what the psalmist does in the imprecatory psalms, he says, God, you made a promise to us. You made a promise to Abraham and his descendants that you would call down judgment. You would bring judgment, a cursing, on those who cursed your people. Now these folks are cursing us, the Philistines, the Moabites, they're cursing us. So we ask you to fill your, fill your promise and bring down judgment upon them, even as you promised. So there's a theological basis in calling down this judgment on the psalmist enemies. It's helpful as we read these psalms to see what was the intent behind them. As we look at these psalms, what was the intent of the psalmist when he prayed for God's judgment on his enemies? What well, we find in chapter 7, verse 8, that the prayer for judgment on the enemies is intended ultimately to establish the righteous. He says, the Lord judges the people, vindicate me according to my righteousness and my integrity that is in me. By judging the enemy, God establishes the righteous. In addition to that, by judging the enemy, there's reason for God's people to praise him. Verse 17 of, ch of chapter 7. I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. God will be praised when the enemies of his people are held accountable for their actions and judged. And then we see that there's an evangelistic motivation behind these psalms. In Psalm 58, verse 11, we see that the psalmist wants the um, the enemy to be judged so they'll repent and turn to the Lord. In uh, verse 11 of Psalm 58, and men will say, surely there is reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on earth. So these prayers for judgment are intended to help people recognize that there is a God who holds them accountable. Psalm 59 Verse 13 shows that the psalmist intends these prayers of judgment to demonstrate God's sovereignty. Destroy them in wrath. Destroy them that they may be no more. That men may know that God rules in Jacob. <laughs> when the enemy are judged, they'll recognize there is a God who rules. And then Psalm 69, verse 28, the psalmist says, Lord, distinguish the temporal destinies between the wicked and the righteous by your judgment. And uh, Psalm 68 verse uh, uh, 69 verse 28, may they be blotted out of the book of life that they may not be recorded with the righteous. The book of life is the book of the living. It's not eternal life, it's the book of the living. May they be blotted out. In other words, distinguish the destiny of the righteous from the destiny of the wicked, the temporal destiny. So judge them so that our lives can be distinguished from theirs. And finally, Psalm 83, verse 16 and following, judge them so that they will seek you. Um, the, the prayer for judgment is intended ultimately to point them uh, to the Lord. 83, verse 16, fill their faces with dishonor that they may seek your name, O Lord. So these penitential psalms pray that God would judge the enemies of his people. And, you know, we wonder, how do these fit with our our uh, pattern today. And I think of, of um, Paul as he spoke uh, about his enemies who had um, criticized him and made life difficult for, for him. And he says he's turned them over to the Lord for the Lord to deal with, for the Lord to judge. And uh, so he didn't pray these prayers himself. He said, Lord, I'm giving it to you to deal with my enemies. And uh, Jesus gave the same emphasis in terms of turning the other cheek. When I pray for my enemies, I pray that they will be humbled, that God would draw them to himself, and uh, that ultimately they will come to, to know and trust him. The next category are the penitential psalms, and the key element in these psalms is the psalmist's penitence, his confession of his own sin and failure. And here we find an acknowledgment of guilt and the need for divine favor. 
And so uh, as we consider the penitential psalms, uh, certainly Psalm 51 stands out as a psalm of penitence where David confesses his sin with Bathsheba. In uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, we find that David confesses his sin and is forgiven, but his confession is rather brief there. But here we see the full extent of David's confession of his sin. And uh, this is the central feature of the penitential psalm. So David in Psalm 51, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, your loving kindness, your loyal love, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. So David is pleading for pardon. He adds, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. He is pr praying for God's pardon. And then his confession begins in verse 3 and continues through verse 6. For I know my transgression, and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You may say, well, didn't David sin against Bathsheba and against Uriah? Yes, but ultimately his sin was against God. All sin is ultimately against God. And David his, confesses his sin. And then he prays for cleansing. Verse 7, purify me with hyssop that I may be clean. Wash me that I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear the joy of gladness and let the bones which you have broken rejoice. God has chastened David and he's praying for restoration. And then as David continues in verse 13, he resolves to serve God. He says, once I've been restored, he says, I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted. <laughs> he says, I'm going to become an evangelist for your holiness. And um, so he prays that God would cleanse him and forgive him and restore him, that he can serve God faithfully. And then finally, he prays for his people. By your favor, do good to Zion, Jerusalem. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then, your delight, uh, then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then the young bulls will be offered on your altar. So he prays for Jerusalem. We can confess our sins, and uh, we're promised uh, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. And this is David's extensive confession of his sin, an example of a penitential psalm. The pilgrim psalms are also known as songs of ascent. And these are songs, psalms, that were sung by the Jewish pilgrims as they went up to Jerusalem to celebrate the festivals. According to Deuteronomy 16, verse 16, three times a year the Jews had to go up to Jerusalem. They went up during Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Deuteronomy 16, verse 16. Jerusalem is about 2,500 feet above sea level, and so going to Jerusalem meant going up, going up from the Jericho, going up from the Sea of Galilee, going up from uh, the coastal plain. You were always going up when you went to Jerusalem. So these are the songs that are sung as they ascended, as they went up to the um, to Jerusalem to worship. And Psalm 22 is uh, one of my favorites among these songs of ascent or pilgrim psalms. And it begins by speaking of the joy of going up to Jerusalem. And on the left there you see the western wall of Jerusalem, a remnant of, of Herod's. A temple platform that he built on which the temple was ultimately situated. But the joy of going up, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. I love to go through the uh, Jaffa gate in Jerusalem and then I turn to this psalm and, and uh, read it to my students. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. That's a thrill. <laughs> That's a thrill to be in Jerusalem, the city of the great king. And then he describes the features. He says, Jerusalem that is built, a city that is compact together. It's a small city. It's a compact city to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel. It was required by law that the Jews would go up three times a year to give public acknowledgement to the name of the Lord. There's our word, yada, that word for giving praise or public acknowledgement. For their thrones were set for judgment, thrones of the house of David. And there we have the rule of David there from Jerusalem. 
And then we see the prayer, pray for the shalom, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. Unfortunately, today we see turmoil going on in Jerusalem and, and uh, terrorist attacks and other things, and we're exhorted to pray for Jerusalem and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I know peace will come one day when Jesus returns and establishes a just and righteous rule of, over all the earth from Jerusalem. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may shalom, peace, be within you. And for the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good, seeking good for Jerusalem. The next category of psalms are called the royal psalms, or also the enthronement psalms. And these psalms emphasize the kingship of the Lord himself, God's kingship. And what the psalmist sees in these psalms is that Yahweh reigns. He's sitting on his throne. He's ruling over creation. And so the psalmist declares in these psalms, Yahweh is king. The Lord is king. Vesterman points out that the basis of these psalms is descriptive praise. We're describing God, and he is king. And praise of this nature is expanded and modified by the declaration of God's kingship. <clears throat> describing God's kingship. Psalm 96 is a good example. <clears throat> Psalm 96 begins with an imperative called the praise. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the people. And so there we see the imperative call to praise God. And uh, God is, is to be praised. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Tell of his glory, his glorious reputation among the nations. And then the reason for praise, why should we praise God? Verse 4, for great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And then in verse 5, for all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord, he made the heavens. He is the creator. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. And so we see the, um, the praise, the reasons for praise. And then the proclamation of his kingship. Verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the earth, uh, of the people. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth and say among the nations, The Lord reigns. And that can be translated, Yahweh is king. So here we have the proclamation of God's kingship. God is king. You know, there's earthly presidents and there's earthly kings, but overall is God, the great king. And the ultimate king is King Jesus, and it's through him that the, his kingdom will be established on earth. Verses 11 through 13, we see praise uh, to the coming judge of the earth. God is not only king, he's also judge. And it says in verse 13, before the Lord, for he is coming, he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and all the people in his faithfulness. God is king, and he is judge, and he's coming to judge his people. That's a psalm that is kind of sobering, isn't it? God is king, and God is judge. So these royal psalms proclaim the kingship, and the ultimate king is, of course, King Messiah. And these psalms have a messianic theme as well. The didactic psalms are the psalms that have a common purpose of teaching truth. The didactic psalms teach. And uh, Psalm 15 is, uh, is an excellent example of a didactic psalm, a psalm that teaches truth. Let's turn to Psalm 15. And here we see ten qualities that God values in Psalm 15. O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Here's a question. It's a rhetorical question. It's the question of what kind of person does God delight to spend time with? If you had to spend a year on a remote island doing research on some great scientific prog project, and you had you had you could choose a companion, whom would you choose? 
who you choose to spend time with you alone there for a year? Well, this is the kind of question that is being asked in Psalm 15. What kind of person does God delight to spend time with? And so the psalmist describes this kind of person. Ten great values. He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart and does not slander with his tongue nor do, does evil to his neighbor nor takes up a reproach against his friend in whose eyes a reprobate is despised who honors those who fear the Lord and swears to his own hurt and doesn't change. He does not put out his money at interest nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. It's important to realize that this psalm isn't about how to get saved by doing good deeds. It's a psalm about what kind of character, what kind of person God enjoys spending time with. And I think it's, a, it's an example uh, to us as to what kind of people we want to be as men and women of God, the kind of people that God delights to spend time with. One of the subcategories of the didactic psalms is the wisdom psalms. And these wisdom psalms uh, focus on the great themes of the wisdom literature. And we often see the two ways motif, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And the Psalm 1 features that, uh, um, that wisdom theme. Um, the, uh, he talks about the blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh. And in his law, he meditates day and night. That's the, the wise man. The wicked are not so. They're like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment or sinners in the assembly of the righteous. You see that contrast between the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Jesus focused on this contrast in his Sermon on the Mount when he talked about the man who builds his house on a rock in contrast to the man who builds his house on the sand. The man who builds on the sand is the person who hears the teachings of Jesus and then rejects it or ignores it and goes the other way. The man who builds his house on the rock is the person who hears and then applies the teachings of Jesus. So these are wisdom psalms. And Psalm 1, Psalm 37, uh, Psalm 112, Psalm 133 are other examples. One of my favorite categories of the Psalms are the Torah Psalms. The Torah Psalms give praise to God for his instruction. The word law literally means instruction. That's the best rendering of the Hebrew word Torah. Torah uh, has the idea of teaching or uh, instruction. And so the Torah Psalms they are Psalms that teach about God's law, God's instruction. And in these psalms, the word of God is glorified and, and exalted. And we find that there are different synonyms that are used to describe the law. It's uh, referred to as the law, the statutes, the judgments, the testimonies, the precepts, the commandments, the promises. All of these are words that are used to describe the law of God, his teaching. Psalm 19 is a wonderful example of the of the Torah Psalm, but it begins with a praise of God's creation and his revelation in nature. This is a, a, a picture of the uh, Glacier Peak and Glacier Lake in the Eagle Cap Wilderness in northeastern Oregon. So it's one of the most beautiful spots I've ever, I've ever been to. A beautiful lake and glaciers and mountain peak. Um, but it reminds me of what God has done in nature. And in the first part of Psalm 19, we see God's revelation in nature. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament, the uh, declaring the work of his hands. But then he goes on from de describing God's revelation in nature, which is general revelation, to God's more specific revelation in his word. And notice in verse 7, the Torah, the law, the Torah of Yahweh is perfect restoring the soul. The testimonies of Yahweh are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether, more desirable than gold, yes, much fine gold, and sweeter than honey 
and the drippings of the honeycomb. So there we just see what the what the word of God is, and uh, then what it what it does. Um, it uh, enlightens the eyes. It um, it's uh, it rejoices the heart. It makes the simple wise. What the what the word is and what it does. And then the application the psalmist makes. Moreover, by them that is by your instruction, your servant is warned, and in keeping them is much reward. There is reward for keeping the instruction of the Lord. Who can discern his errors? Equip me from hidden faults. Keep your servant back from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless. Then I shall be acquitted of great transgression. And then the psalm concludes, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Wow. Torah psalms. Torah psalms really highlight the word of God and the blessing that comes from God's word. The last category in the topic category of psalms are the messianic psalms. The messianic psalms are those psalms which present and predict aspects of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Some skeptics have questioned the validity of this category. Are there really such a thing as, as Torah psalms, excuse me, as messianic psalms, psalms that speak about, about Jesus? I think Jesus answered that question himself when he spoke to the disciples and he said to them in Luke 24 verse 44, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So there are things about Jesus in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. So I, I think we have a strong evidence for the a basis for these messianic psalms that they do speak about Jesus. Psalm 22 is one of these psalms. It's a lament psalm, a lament of the individual. It's a psalm quoted 24 times in the New Testament. So it must be an important psalm quoted 24 times in the New Testament. Notice the superscription. It's a psalm of David. It's a psalm of David, so David wrote this psalm and describes his own experience. But David, as he wrote this psalm, by the Spirit of, the, of God, the Holy Spirit led David to write words and express thoughts that were ultimately true of Jesus the Messiah. So they were true of David on one level, true of the Messiah on another level. David expresses what the Messiah would ultimately express in his sense of lament and his sense of being abandoned by God. So verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, we know that this is quoted by Jesus. Jesus himself quotes this psalm in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the Gospels. In Matthew 27, verse 46, Jesus quotes the words of this psalm. Now this is written by David, but Jesus takes this psalm and expresses his own sense of abandonment as he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus sensed the abandonment of the Father as he took on human sin and uh, bore the weightiness of our sin on his own person. And as he took on our sin, it's as if God turned his back on Jesus. He turned his back on Jesus in such a way that Jesus felt abandoned by the Father, one with whom he had had intimate fellowship for, from eternity past. And in that experience, David cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As David describes the hostility of his enemies, in verse 27, All who see me sneer at me. They separate the lip. They wag the head. And a similar action took place against Jesus when he was on the cross. And this is quoted by Matthew to show that the ultimate fulfillment of this experience was by Jesus on the cross. And then in verse 8, um, uh, David reports that his enemy said, let God deliver him. And the religious leaders said the same thing about Jesus when he hung on the cross. If God really cares for him, let God deliver him. In verse 16, we see a reference to the piercing of the hands and the feet. And this was probably a metaphor in David's experience. He felt as if his enemies had pierced him. But what may have been metaphorical for David became very real in the experience of Jesus. 
he was literally pierced in his hands and his feet by the nails that nailed him to the cross. And then in verse 18, David said, They divide my garments among them, from my clothing, clothing they cast lots. David felt like his enemies wanted the shirt off his back. And that certainly happened when the uh, Roman soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothes. So what happened in the experience of David uh, was repeated in the experience of Jesus on another level. And what was for David something like a, a metaphor became for Jesus something that was very literal and real. David prays for his deliverance in verses 19 through 21. And then he promises praise. Notice verse 22. David says, I will tell your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. Where is David going to praise God? He's going to praise him in the assembly. This is good evidence that David understood that the concept of praise was a public act. It was a public experience. He was going to praise God in the assembly, not in his private prayer closet. And then as the psalmist include, concludes, we see the anticipation of future worship, millennial worship, kingdom worship. He says, in the, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will worship before you. David anticipates a time when all the nations will turn to the Lord and worship him. And then he concludes <clears throat> to the people who will be born, uh, uh, verse thir 31, they will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. He has performed it. What did he, the Messiah Jesus, perform? He performed the work of redemption. I believe that Jesus is paraphrasing verse 31 when he declared on the cross, it is finished. He, the Messiah, had performed it. He had finished the work of redemption. He has finished it. Jesus did this on the cross. Psalm 22 is one of the most known messianic psalms. Psalm 110 is also a, an important messianic psalm. and In fact, it's the most quoted of the psalms in the New Testament. And here we find that Messiah is featured both as, as king, as priest, and, and finally as warrior judge. He's featured as king in the first three verses. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion. Scepter, that's a king's staff. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will volunteer freely. Um, in the day of your power, in holy array from the womb of dawn, your youth are to you as dew. So here is an anticipation of the kingship of Jesus as Messiah King with his scepter. And then his priestly ministry featured in verse 4, the Lord has sworn he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now Jesus couldn't be a priest in the order of Aaron because he wasn't a Levite. He was a Judean. His ancestry came from Judah, not from Levi. So his priesthood has to be of a different order, the order of Melchizedek, the king priest who's described in uh, Genesis 14. The writer of Hebrews makes a point about this, that Jesus could not be a priest according to the order of Aaron because he wasn't a Levite. So his priesthood is a better priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek, um, Hebrews chapter 7. The psalm concludes with a reference to Jesus as the Messiah, warrior, and judge. Um, he will judge the nations. He will fill them with corpses. That's pretty serious judgment. He will shatter chief men over a broad plain. And the, the, the sense here is he's coming as a warrior to judge his enemies. This is the judgment of the day of the Lord, which Joel speaks about and Zephaniah. And uh, Jesus describes uh, in his Olivet Discourse. In Matthew chapter 25. One final uh, messianic psalm is Psalm 2. And in Psalm 2 uh, we see um, the nations are in rebellion against God, but ultimately they are going to be subject to the rule and the reign of the Messiah. Psalm 2, why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? 
the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Mashiach, his Messiah. So here we have a reference to God the Father, the Lord, and his son, Jesus the Messiah. And the nations are shaking their fist in the face of the Messiah. Let us tear their fetters apart, they say, and cast away their cords from us. They're rejecting God. They're turning away from God. They're rejecting their creator. And how does God respond? Verse 4, he who sits in, the, in heaven laughs. He scoffs at them. God chuckles at these impotent kings and rulers and atheists who shake their fist in the face of God and, and ignore the fact that he is the ultimate sovereign. He is, over the, he is the ultimate rule. He will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury. But as for me, I've installed my king upon Zion. And here he affirms that he will put place Jesus right where he belongs there in Jerusalem as the ruler over all. In verses 7 through 9, we see the vindication of the Messiah. Surely I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Paul takes this concept of being begotten and identifies it with being resurrected. Jesus is being resurrected and declared sonship uh, by the Lord at his, at his resurrection. And then the admonition to the rulers. Therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice in trembling. And uh, the Hebrew text reads, and kiss the son. It's translated do homage, but literally kiss the son, that he may not become angry, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. The admonition to the rulers of the nations to submit to the great ruler, to the king himself, because his wrath will one day be kindled. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the fact that he hasn't brought judgment is just a, a demonstration of his grace. He's holding off judgment and giving people time to repent. The Psalms. The Psalms. Conclude, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, Psalm 150. And you know, the Psalms just encourage us to praise God. And uh, so uh, here's a uh, view of the Columbia River Gorge out to the east of Portland. And uh, as I uh, hiked out there and uh, driven out there and, and done some running out there, uh, I'm, I'm led to praise the Lord. And that's how the Psalm, the book of Psalms concludes, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so that's how we conclude uh, this lecture today. May the Lord bless you as you interact uh, with the study questions. And um, I hope that you'll be able to write a psalm testimony that you can share with your cohort and describe the great things that God has done for you.